you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to make a contribution to the appropriation bill. And in, before I start at my contribution, I'd just like to congratulate the member of Hurtervale on her contribution. She has covered a lot of ground, which would, would be of um, great interest to members on this side of the House. And certainly, I would share um, and support the experiences she had regarding homelessness and, other, and disability, etc. And certainly, that's the sort of feedback I'm getting in my electoral office as well. Uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Speaker, uh, I think it's important just to uh, have some um, general remarks before I go into my contribution to the actual bill itself, because today we are now going into the seven-day seven lockdown. And I think why that is necessary, and I can understand why the advice to the government has come along that way, and we should support it because we need to obviously get this disease under control as soon as possible for the benefit of all. Uh, but, Mr. S Mr Speaker, it would be uh, remiss of me if I didn't actually talk, also talk about the impact this will have on ordinary people and small businesses that will be huge. From the older person who is isolated to a small business person who can't trade but still has the huge overheads like rent, etc., to the employees who will lose their, will lose their work, often the most, most of those are in insecure work already, those who actually work on a casual basis, these are the people who hit, hit the worst. So it's important, Mr Speaker, uh, that our state and federal government <coughs> must respond to this, uh, this crisis uh, to ensure uh, quickly and, and thoroughly to ensure that the burden from the COVID-19 is shared fairly and equitably amongst the community. That is the, that's the important response, is to make sure that this response uh, from governments ensures that people who are the most vulnerable actually do get the support they require. <coughs> These lockdowns, Mr Speaker, are for the common good, and so our support must also be for the common good. Our support must go to those most vulnerable, uh, and they must be supported first. With a young person who loses their casual job, uh, to a small business who is tethering on closure of their business, or the person who is homeless, we as a civil and modern society must look after those in greatest need first. It is not a time to boost the profits of the most wealthy in our society. And Mr Speaker, that's also a reason we segue into this budget, because I don't think this budget does much to help the most vulnerable in our community. This budget certainly doesn't do a lot to support the most vulnerable in my community in the electorate of light. Uh, and you look at the horizon, the horizon doesn't look that, that well either. Mr Speaker, the latest gross state uh, product figures released show that South Australia is her, with the worst annual economic growth in the nation at 1.4 per cent for 2019 and 20 financial year. It was 2.4 per cent 17-18 last, last year of the Labor. It was 1.1 per cent in the first year of the Liberal Party and during 2019-20 at 1.4 per cent it was the worst in the country. According to the budget itself, employment growth is forecast to, do, to be 2 per cent in 21-22, then trending down to 1.25 per cent in the following financial years, not figures, sir, which are going to be help those people leaving school or those people seeking work. South Australia currently holds an unenviable title of holding the highest unemployment rate in the country at 5.8 per cent and the highest youth unemployment rate with WA at 11.8 per cent. Mr Speaker, the unemployment rate was 5.6 per cent at the 2018 election. South Australia also has the highest median weight of all states for a, for a job at 34 weeks and 58 weeks in the north of Adelaide. That's right, 58 weeks is the weight for the people in the north of Adelaide, part of my electorate, and those are my colleagues and also around Gawla. In terms of a local response, Mr Speaker, um, there is little good news for, for the local community in the Marshall, government's, La Marshall Liberal Government's fourth state budget. When you look at the Gawla Health Service uh, Emergency Department, the commitment to expand the emergency department at the Gawler Health Service is welcome, but only 2.4 million of the $15 million allocated to the project is budgeted to be spent in 21-22 financial year. According to the budget papers, the new ED will not be operational until June 2024. That's right, after the next state election at the earliest, assuming that things go uh, uh, on time, and that doesn't look uh, to be the case. Interestingly, the State Government has refused to release documents regarding the planning and construction of the expanded ED, which makes it difficult to assess whether additional staffing will also be made, made available. 
An expanded ED without additional staffing will just lead to internal ramping, will be of little benefit to, for patients requiring urgent medical attention. It puts additional stress on the clinicians in that hospital. So you get them in the front door, you put them in an ED, but there's nowhere else for the go. And that's been, if you like, the picture right across the health system in, in our state. So, Mr Speaker, I'm hoping that uh, at some point the government will have the courage to release those details because, as I said, an expanded ED without additional sta uh, staffing will be of no benefit to my community. When it comes to ambulance services, Mr Speaker, which has been uh, a major issue in my local community, there are people who have actually died waiting for an ambulance when they shouldn't have done. They shouldn't have done. Uh, no additional funding has been announced to increase the ambulance presence in the town and surrounding districts. We just heard that uh, the additional 74 positions, which the government has now uh, agreed to fund, we actually would not be enough to actually provide an additional unit or additional relief staff, in, staff funding in my area. So the, the paramedics in my region will again be understaffed, working hard, uh, working long hours, risking their own health, but just as importantly, putting the risk of local community people uh, at risk as well. Mr Speaker, uh, it's, it's also welcome news that uh, the government has actually announced that it actually would undertake a, st a study to establish an SES unit in Gawler. Uh, the budget does not include an undertaking for, pla uh, does include undertake for planning and design for, for a joint incident management facility. CFS Regional Headquarters and SES Unit Williston in response to Labor's 2020 commitment to build a dedicated SES unit if elected in 2022. While the announcement is good news, there is no commitment to actually fund the project over the next four years. Construction of the SES unit will not start until after the 2026 election at the earliest based on budget figures provided. I've been working with Salisbury SS unit for some years to explore the feasibility of opening a satellite unit in Gawler under their auspices. The unit will be initially under the management of the SS unit until enough members can be recruited to ensure its long-term viability. In 2019, the SS requ uh, acquired land on Gawler Road at Williston for that purpose, yet not one brick has been laid to build a new facility in an area of Gawler. The establishment of a local SS unit in Gawler is vital the nearest unit is in Kapunda, uh, apart from Salisbury. Having a local presence will be very important in attracting new volunteers to the service, but also protecting the community. A preliminary investigation indicates that a capital cost of about $2 million will be required to establish the unit. The North Power and Gordo River systems are known as a flood risk area uh, that, that floods every 10 years. And so this, having a local SS unit is very important to the safety of my community. Mr Speaker, there's one other issue, a uh, couple other issues I'd like to also touch upon, one which has actually been touched upon also by the member for Hurtowell, but this is an issue which is of a growing crisis in my community, and I'm sure right across the state, and that's of homelessness. Uh, the, the number of inquiries my electoral office gets about people who are homeless has grown exponentially uh, by a whole range of factors, uh, and it's been made worse by the fact that now, with the booming house prices, a number of landlords are taking the opportunity to sell their, pro their properties at the, at the higher prices, and unfortunately the tenants are being evicted. Only last week, Mr Speaker, I had a family of five come and see me, have been excellent tenants, same place for five years, good rental record, etc. Uh, but now the, their uh, landlord has, has uh, uh, sold their property, and like most landlords, it's a better sale if it's vacant possession, which means the tenants have to go. The family of five have to go. It's, they've got three weeks to find a new place. There are no public housing. There's no social housing, and that's going to the private market. So, but in the private market, Mr. Speaker, at the moment, is very difficult. The fact remains that every, every open inspection for a rental, there might be 30 or 40 different people, and in fact, an auction then starts. Who can actually pay the most rent to get in the place? Which means it leaves the poorest and most vulnerable out in the cold once again. The impact of homelessness is actually, uh, I don't think, it's often well understood. If you're homeless, you're not able to look after yourself. You can't you know, wash your clothes, can't keep yourself clean. You can't actually go for looking for work either. There is just the, the lack of resources and the ability to actually look for work to get yourself back on your feet. So having a home is the first step of actually getting your life back on track. And we, I think we need to understand that, Mr. Mr. Speaker, as a community. And in my, in my case, the government's response has been as follows. 
is to close the housing SA office in Gawler. That's the government's response, is to close the housing SA office in my, elect in my community. Under the co cover of COVID, they closed it down for COVID and they've actually now taken down the signage and closed the office. And now people in my community have to go to, to Elizabeth, uh, the closest place, to actually get any support for housing. That is actually treating the most vulnerable in our community with the greatest contempt. The people who need the greatest support are being treated with the greatest contempt by this government. Fortunately, um, we have good relationships with a number of NGOs who have come and filled that gap to some extent. Anglicare Homelessness Services are actually providing services locally now. Uh, Lutheran Care Services are providing financial counselling and support services. But these are basic services which government used to provide but have just walked away, have walked away from those in our community. Uh, and this government's record in, when it comes to supporting the most vulnerable in our community is, is not good. Mr Speaker, uh, we have the most vulnerable in our community, so, what, uh, so it hasn't helped the fact that uh, we don't have a train service at the moment. Uh, I, I do understand the service needs to be closed down while it's electrified. I have no criticism of a government doing that, not at all. I think it's great they're doing that. It's great it's doing that. But what I do have a legitimate criticism is their response in terms of their substitute services. They have improved some. I must confess the department has listened. I assume they've listened to my, my feedback and they've improved some. But they don't go far enough. They do not go far enough. No, so first of all, uh, and they've improved. First of all, there are still a number of people who say, look, we don't just go to work peak times. There are, you know, the, we have now a 24-hour economy almost. There are people who go to work at different times. And so there are no express services from Gawler apart from the peak time. So those people who actually have the, only the GA1 or GA2 take hours to get to work into the city and hours to get home. So these are the people who are under the most pressure already actually, actually incur greater pressure still. An additional cost, etc. They're away from their families, away from the communities. So I would call, implore on the government that they actually revisit and see if they can actually improve the availability of substitute services. The number of people using the substitute service has increased, which is good, because they have improved. But I think the government can actually do better in this regard. Uh, people will accept the closure of services if there are reasonable substitute services in their place. Uh, at one stage, the government was going to actually reduce the, the, um, the other uh, bus service in this town. Fortunately, that, that, uh, that matter was scrapped uh, by the government. Uh, the, now we're, we have an increasing number of complaints about the 49 on demand service, which is a, a service that's been around some time, has different names. But increasingly, I'm hearing complaints about uh, people not being picked up or being picked up late. And that's really just a question of resources. It, it is clear that the model is not working because it's not funded properly. That model is a good model. Uh, the on response, the response model is, I think, is a good, uh, good model. Uh, and, but in, in areas of smaller populations, but it has to be, re has to be funded properly and run, and run better. At the moment, it's been late. It's not picking up people. It's not a home-to-home -home service like it used to be uh, because, obviously, cutbacks to, to the funding for the service. So the government needs to do better in that regard. Uh, Mr Speaker, just across the boundary, though, in the Barossa, they are, the on-demand service, they had a huge trial, and then they've cut it back. Uh, it's interesting they cut it back during the COVID period. Again, under the, under the cover of COVID, the government has done a lot of things to actually undermine the um, social infrastructure in our communities. Mr Speaker, uh, in terms of physical infrastructure, uh, there's no monies in this budget to actually upgrade the roundabout at Red Banks Road. And why is that important in my community? Well, there are hundreds and hundreds of students who cross that roundabout to get home or to get to buses, etc. And what they do now is at peak time, they just walk across the roadways. And it just, they play, literally play Russian roulette with their own personal safety because there are no footpaths, there are no crossings at this roundabout. There are, there, the students have to do the wrong thing. These people have to do the wrong thing to actually get home. There is no solution. Or they, sorry, there is a solution, but the government refused it. In fact, sadly, the minister wrote to me recently and said, the roundabout is actually operating quite safely, quite well, to the horror of the parents in the school community who, who've seen it. And it's, it, it's sad that the government cannot invest 
in some minor upgrades to make life safer. The Dalkeith Rail Crossing. Uh, for a while, it was a sort of a ping-pong game between local government and the government saying who's the responsibility. Clearly, this crossing is the responsibility of the government because the crossing is fa has failed in between the lines. It is clearly the responsibility of the state government. I've had complaints from a whole range of uh, local residents. Uh, in fact, it's interesting that they now actually had to reduce the speed along this crossing. They've actually reduced it from 80 kilometres to 60 kilometres. On the one hand, they say it's quite safe, but now this, the minister wrote back and said, well, we've reduced the speed now, it's safer. So uh, it's interesting the government's quite claim to rural roads is that they can actually increase speeds because they've actually made them safer. In my community, we've actually had to reduce speeds because the speeds are not safe, yet the government does nothing to invest in that public infrastructure. Uh, not only the ordinary people who use it, but also the emergency services in the area who use it, who have complained about the risk it puts their members, some volunteers, by crossing that uh, crossing at a speed which is actually to reflect the emergency. Mr Speaker, this government is not doing well, well enough. But also, in terms of its um, uh, the rail electrification, as a cost-saving measure, what the, um, what the contractors have done, I suppose they have to work within the budget given to them by the government, uh, they've actually uh, closed a number of pedestrian crossings along the way rather than create alternative crossings so people can actually can still cross safely. And the result has been that people have been walking across roads to get that way. Mr Speaker, it was no surprise to me earlier this week on uh, five... Um, Eight, uh, sorry, Radio 891, uh, the ABC radio on Jules Schiller show, I think, when they actually talked about some of the key issues in the north. And one of the key issues is Curtis Road, the congestion around Curtis Road, safety around Curtis Road. Um, Mr Speaker, it's interesting that uh, when asked in the recent uh, Budget and Finance Committee about this issue, the head of the department actually said he was unaware of any issues with Curtis Road. No issues. This is a road which has actually now been highlighted by residents as being the number one transport uh, infrastructure issue, it, well, number one infrastructure issue in this community which abuts both my um, uh, electorate of Light and, uh, and also the electorate of Taylor, the joining electorate of Taylor, but also impacts on Elizabeth, the electorate of Elizabeth, because people from Blakeview, etc. The issue is as follows. It's, it's obviously the new, new population base, new schools in the area, creates traditional traffic. Uh, people also try to access uh, the Northern Expressway and the Northern Connector, uh, two great projects by, um, by the Labor, late, previous Labor government and also uh, in, in support with the previous Federal Liberal government under Tony Abbott, one of his last promises before they, they ditched him. So, these, uh, so people are using this road a greater deal. So um, it is not an upgrade which the local community can, can, can afford in terms of its council. Some preliminary estimates require, it says it requires about $200 million. So I think it's important that the, both the state government, the federal government and the local government work together to upgrade this road and bring it to a standard which is appropriate. Um, it is not only an issue where people spend an endless time on the roads, but also safety issues where people get really agitated and start doing some silly things. Uh, that issue, Mr Speaker, needs to be addressed. Uh, Mr Speaker, that, uh, what you will find in this budget um, is a lack of, of investment in the, in, the northern community, in the northern suburbs, but also in Gawler, and that's certainly how my community sees it. Uh, for example, Mr Speaker, um, we, I welcome the investment in expanding the Mark Oliphant College. Um, that's welcome exp uh, expenditure. Uh, to, to cater for the new Year 7s next year, the additional Year 7s. But what hasn't been made available is additional uh, infrastructure for additional traffic, which that will generate, or additional parking. And talk about congestion around that school around peak times. It is, it is, it is a, a real huge problem and raised by people. The other issue in my community in terms of transport is, is taxis. You know, taxis are, we, I get endless complaints about the lack of taxi services. Now, the government has effectively deregulated the industry in that local community. But what it didn't, what it didn't work out was that deregulation actually kills off some of the local, local players, and the big players will not come for those small fees, those small trips. So the older community who need public transport services 
have been hit heavily uh, by this lack of services, transport services. So, Mr Speaker, all in all, unfortunately, this, this budget has very little to my community to be happy about. 